everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. I uh, hope everybody's having a great week to this point. Uh, I'm going to move right into this uh, in just a second, but uh, I want to remind you first and foremost that we are still in the middle of a fundraiser. We are significantly behind and our goals have been for uh, as far back as I know and remember, but that's uh, here, neither here or there. What we do know is the work that we do is absolutely necessary, and the demand for what we do is increasing, and we need your support. On a more specific note, I mentioned a few days ago that someone contacted me for some relief and the organization is stretched beyond resources. We are fulfilling needs based solely on the, the strength of what we're doing and that comes directly from me. This person is in need of rental assistance there in the Houston area. Uh, you have a couple of ways you can do this. You can show love and support us and we'll flip that and support them. Or if you don't wanna deal with and go through what we're doing that's fine if you want to do this directly i have consulted with this young lady she has children she just recently actually moved to houston and i'm working and the resources of the people who really have boots on the ground are strapped especially at this particular point in time in the month we've already done our, our assisting and everything and so we're a little bit uh, out of whack I'm still trying to work it but if you have resources or you want to help her and you don't want to do it through me I'm 100% okay with that uh, I'll give you the information she really doesn't want her name out there but I can give you the apartment location the amount and you can do that she has secured a job and she has gone full time but she just doesn't have it now and we know how this thing works there's no sympathy there's no consideration uh, they will evict her and uh, I'm gonna do everything on my end to remedy the situation but it would be great if you guys will show some love and support also uh, despite the fact of you hearing me say that we're limited resources please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you're in a situation if you're dealing with some issues with your child in school if you're dealing with your is some issues with your family members in the justice system or your children in the juvenile system if you're dealing with uh, problems with getting food if you're dealing with problems with you please reach out we will figure out something I don't want people to start thinking okay things are dire and there's nowhere to go reach out we'll work it out but I'm trying to get those who are in a position to show love and support to do so uh, with that being said uh, I'm going to move on um, into this brief discussion look um, everybody heard about the mass shooting in um, Philadelphia where five people were ultimately killed and I want to touch on that. What I also want to examine, and, and, and my colleague, partner, and friend, Dr. Michael Blanchett, and I did a short uh, topical paper, uh, research paper on uh, mass shootings and violence specifically as it pertains to schools because a lot of those mass shootings that we're hearing about happen that happens at school uh, but there is definitely an uptick of uh, mass shootings uh, in the US something that needs to be studied in depth but I'm gonna tell you what needs to be studied in depth I think even on 4th of July there were a total of 17 mass shootings uh, in the US on that one day um, now obviously how they classify mass shootings is uh, at least three people being shot within a certain period of time by the same shooter okay so with that being said uh, we had 17 but this one particular one in Philadelphia stood out for a couple of reasons number one the victims were black number two the shooter was black Number three is the one that's actually got me 
really truly on edge and that's the fact that this person was gender affluent or uh, transgender or whatever you want to call it now they were if I'm not mistaken a man transitioning into a woman or identifying as a woman and you can see different pictures of them you know as a man and then with them obviously being on hormones and developing breasts and the reason that this caught my attention is this is at least the third mass shooting by a transgendered individual and each time the victims have been completely random and innocent this isn't somebody retaliating because they were mishandled this isn't somebody retaliating against the person who harmed them this is somebody choosing innocent people and firing randomly and killing people and the last time it happened I believe it was a female identifying as a male and they went into a school and began shooting uh, so I am by nature a researcher uh, from a scientific perspective so I am trained and conditioned to ask why I don't just accept things at face value I don't just sit up and look at outcomes and say look at where we are at my my approach is always how did we get here what is actually the underlying cause of this so you know and we're still with with two or three mass shootings being uh, at the hands of gender affluent uh, people people who are identifying with other than their assigned gender at birth uh, that's a very small sample size the uh, unit of analysis is small but because the group itself is small and that's completely out of what we would normally see from that group we should be in the early stages examining what's going on and why and so I'm gonna launch some research and I'm pretty sure that's not a lot of existing data because this is a new phenomenon but we've got to start examining the mindset because for this particular group to become that hostile and aggressive towards innocent people what's the driving force so you have to ask and here's why I'm asking what the driving force is because it's either conspiracy meaning that there is a collective uh, communication among certain part of this group that this is what they're going to do to bring exposure and awareness to their quote unquote uh, dilemma or struggle or whatever they refer to it as right or there are underlying emotional and psychological issues that are being triggered by certain realities and experiences and environments and these things need to be studied and understood to first of all mitigate any harm or marginalize or reduce the risk of any harm happening to innocent people but also to provide relief for the people who are dealing with it if it's really truly em emotional or psychological duress or psychosis then we need to be addressing this instead of ignoring it um, what we have is a ongoing situation of a social disruption that is reverberating across all types of realities so it's not just uh, gender affluent uh, mass shootings we had 17 mass shootings we've had having mass shootings it's become a release or a new form of creating a voice or sending a message and so we need to examine that we need to also look at how we in the black community plan on protecting our family members from what you can't predict because there are no predictable scalable uh, measurement are tools to sit up and say hey this is likely to happen in this area at this time and these are things that dr. Blanchard and I talked about 
in this uh, thing. There's bill, uh, creating school security systems and su security departments and resource offices. All that stuff has become uh, a multi-billion dollar a year industry. And yet it's not aimed at the schools most likely to experience it. It's aimed at inner city kids who while there are shootings they're not mass shootings they're normally conflict driven it's done but so in essence we can't expect a system that is either incapable or unwilling to do something about this to provide the protection we need so then we have to understand this we have to understand whether we agree with uh gender or fluidity or not we have to understand that something's happening here we need to be dealing with it we need to have one of the things we have failed in and i've preached this until i'm blue in the face is we fail to develop an understanding of how things operate we we fail to develop an understanding of what drives different things in our community what drives our reality we'll talk about the widening wealth gap but we, do we really understand what's creating it and the answer for the most part is no is there information out there absolutely i've written books i've written articles i've created courses to literally point you to how to be aware of what's happening how to offset it and how to reverse it but you have to be willing to seek it and it's so much easier for us to ignore it and point the finger of the blame let me tell you something i want to be very clear here to every black person that hears this look complaining is not a plan nor is it a strategy whining is not a plan nor is it a strategy what we need is strategies what we need is plans what we need is a specific agenda what we need is direct awareness of what we're up against and what we plan on doing about it what we need are protocols that predicate how we respond to different things so that we're not acting out of our emotions when you look at other other groups there are protocols this happens this is what we do we don't have to sit up and act out and let our emotions guide us it's like hey step one step two we, we'll escalate until you hear us and there there are these steps of escalation in these protocols protocols guide behavior in disruptive and highly emotional times so that you're not depending on your emotions when you are in a highly stressful situation and it's likely that your prefrontal cortex has shut down your prefrontal cortex is what responsible for what reason ration impulse control uh being able to problem solve and so when you're in a highly stressful or emotional situation that tends to set down and your your brain and your body starts to go into what fight or flight mode a stress response and what happens is we're acting constantly out of this stress response with no true direction or sense of what to do and we don't have any specific protocols in place because we haven't invested in understanding we haven't invested in the research we haven't invested in uh problem solving we have a couple of think tanks the odyssey project that uh the harvest institute and maybe one more that are actually engaged and committed to discern discerning deciphering and understanding the issues we're facing and providing solutions we need multiple think tanks we need to be able to sit down and have these think tanks examine everything we're facing from education gentrification mass incarceration uh business ownership on down the line the the ongoing one of the things we definitely have to examine is this ongoing uh assault on the black family especially black marriage and to understand where it's coming from to understand why singleness is being pushed so hard upon blacks anytime you see something about how wonderful it is to be single even when it's coming from mainstream has a black image on it that's not by accident we have to understand the same ones who are pushing this if you check them they are married they are operating uh, predominantly from a traditional family nucleus while they are pushing single lifestyles on the black community this isn't to malign people who are single this is to say you have to understand the basic 
makeup of how values, interests, and principles are most effectively projected into the future. Let me explain something to you. At, at, at the core, every cultural enclave, every racial enclave, every racial, ethnic, or religious group has a set of values, inter, interests, and principles at their core that sustain them. The values, interests, and principles that the original um, slaves brought with them were disrupted, removed, and replaced with Eurocentric ideas of what is, what is important, how things will move. The natural family was disrupted. The griots were killed. The griots were the teachers and the reminders of history. And as long as griots existed, people knew where they came from. There was a natural respect and pride of heritage, uh, of, of heritage. And, the res and, and, and the awareness and the pride in the heritage made it very difficult to subjugate the slaves. See, it's not the shackles that subjugate. The shackles in prison, the subjugation is mental. And when you and if you can't remove the pride, it's almost impossible to remove the principle. But if you can kill the pride uh, in a way that there's no longer an awareness of who you descend from, what you once were, where you came from, what you are capable of. Now I can instill in you an identity of inferiority and give you the principles and values and the things that you should look up to and the things that you should assess power to systematically without interference. And this is where subjugation happens. So then we must understand that if we are ever going to rise above our current state at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, the bottom state at every area that matters in the ability to execute and present power. We talk about empowerment, but our behavior is not indicative of that of a people who are really looking to truly empower themselves. We talk it, we, we'll big fish it, we, 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 we'll, we'll do some things, but when it's time to come together, because there's no true congruence or connectivity and unification in a specified plan it's what I feel like doing it's what sounds right to me and there's no universal definition I've said this when it comes to manhood one of the biggest problems with black manhood now is not that black men don't want to be the best we can be we're still trying to define manhood why because there's no universal definition for black manhood it's the who's got the bag uh, or in this culture over here who's got the best mouth game who can make you know who who can pull the most women who can bed the most women all these different definition is losing sight of the total nucleus of what makes a man the protector the provider the pro, uh, promoter the prophet and the priest these things are simply not being taught on a universal level because there's no unity, there's no connectivity, there's no desire to come together and support something that can show us a better way. We are declining and they keep showing us images that give, give the illusion that we are in some way rising and making it, but the numbers don't bear out, but most of us aren't checking the numbers. And when people like myself come along and speak the truth, it's resisted, it's pushed back. And then those who may be out there are more focused on being entertained and more focused on sensationalism, more focused on escapism, more focused on anything that will make them laugh, make them dance, make them, make them happy in the midst of misery is what they're looking for. Instead of changing the situation and creating an environment where happiness is the natural state of existence. Happiness is not the natural state of existence for the black person in America. We have to manufacture it. We have to manufacture it with the cars we drive. We have to manufacture it with the trips we take. We have to manufacture it with how much we make uh, on our jobs. We have to manufacture it by finding people who are doing worse than we are so we can feel good about our own miserable uh, uh, reality. We have not 
taken the time to sit up and come together as a unified people and create an existence for ourselves that encapsulates us and provides for us impotence in which we can move forward and execute our power and make our presence felt. We still have other people writing our story. We have other people telling our story their way. We have other people giving representations of who we are when in truth we are a good people, a kind people, a loving people, a hard-working people. We are a people who naturally love and care, but we've been broken, we've been bruised, we've been beat down, we've been manhandled and mistreated, and that trauma is literally permeating through every cell of our body. I've written about it. I've lectured on it. I've traveled to places outside of the U.S. and taught on it. I've drawn the correlations between our stressful environments and cancer, our stressful environments and lupus. I've introduced us to adverse childhood experiences on a grand on a grand scale and what that means uh, for our children and the future of our children. We've got generations being damaged before they ever come out of grade school with situations and biological dispositions that are going to impact them throughout their lives because we are unaware of how things work. When I was doing my work, when I first really truly delved into epigenetics as a means of multi, uh, the transmission of multi-generational trauma, but also as a high influencer of disease and the increased proclivity to be traumatized in highly stressful situations. Uh, when I first started looking at this, it was solely for the purpose of solidifying the argument of multi-generational trauma because everyone in the 90s were talking about, man, it's been over 100 years. It's, it's, it's time to let that slavery thing go. It's been 100 years. Ain't nobody out here been a slave. And so, you know, that was the thing. And so there had to be some scientific, pragmatic and empirical data that based and founded and anchored the argument for multi-generational trauma. We could see it. We knew it was there. We're living it. We're seeing it. But we needed something expressed. And I thank God for Dr. Jar DeGruz's uh, work, and I want to say uh, 2007, 2000, somewhere up in there, with post-traumatic slave syndrome. It brought it out and it, 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 it gave it uh, some awareness. But I've been, search I've been doing this thing since the, the 90s. And what I discovered in doing this was uh, epigenetics really took a real strong turn uh, post -holo Jewish Holocaust because the Jews found some phenomenons that concerned them. Uh, one of the phenomenons, which is quite interesting, and you start to learn about this when you start learning about epigenetic tags and uh, the, the ability of genes and cells to literally hold memories, but that's a whole nother thing. But uh, one of the things they discovered is their grandchildren, children that weren't even born during the Holocaust and had never been told about specific events, were dreaming about the events. This wasn't their children. This was their grandchildren. So their experiences had such an emphatic imprint upon them that the epigenetic tags that actually should have been reduced are completely washed away through the uh, reproductive process in which 23 chromosomes from the male and 23 chromosomes from the female come together to create the 46 chromosome so they create another person the dna sequencing that writes out everything that you'll ever be and your all, all of that is set up in the reproductive system to remove a lot of the genetic uh, negatives that come with it stress disease and all that but Sometimes it can be so emphatic that it's not right. Well, the experience for them was so emphatic that their grandchildren were literally still impacted by it, even though they had never experienced it. And so they wanted to find out how. So they invested in research. 
And this research uncovered the power of epigenetics to not only uh, influence the passing down of trauma, but the increased risk or proclivity to be traumatized by trauma. So it's, un it's, it's important to understand that just because you experience a traumatic event does not mean that you will be traumatized by it. You've got people that are in the same situation at the same time, mass shooting. Some will be in counseling for years. Others went through their, uh, their, their post uh, event counseling and haven't been back since functioning naturally they moved on through it and there are a number of different factors too many to get into now but if you have epigenetic tags in which your parents had traumatic experiences that impacted them and they passed them on to you the, you are more likely to be traumatized by stressful events but here's another thing when you have those same uh, tags uh, or you are currently in a stressful situation it increases uh, the chance of you getting disease because what? Highly stressful situations can turn on disease genes, turn off uh, um, immune immune genes, can upregulate, downregulate genes, and you can end up being ill. That we know now something that um, up until some some years ago we did not understand is that the vast majority of disease, including cancer, including heart disease is stress related environmental stress over time lowers the ability of the immune system to operate through a systematic and uh, incessant down regulation of the immune system and an up regulation uh, turning on of disease genes we understand that but because we understand that at least we have the awareness of the importance of creating non-stressful environments and so in, in, in that sense, that's a part of it, but there's so much more to be done. But here's the thing. We go back to the yeah. senseless killing in Philadelphia. And uh, first of all, may those who pass away rest in peace. May God be with the family of those who were lost. Um, we can't be constantly behind the eight ball as a people. What do you mean, Doc? We can't constantly be in a position of reacting. We're going to have to learn how to be proactive. We're going to have to learn to see something and then move on it, manage it, master it, understand it, and develop systems and plans and strategies to overcome it before it becomes so monumental that we can't get our hands around it. We are constantly acting from 10 years ago on things. And then we are wondering why we're so overwhelmed and overtaken and vulnerable is because we refuse to commit to taking action until it's too late. Things that I've been sounding the horn about for years, the feminization of the black male image. Now, this isn't anything to do with homosexuality. This is the feminization of the heterosexual male image. Oh, we, they did it real subtly, you know, we started with metrosexual, you know, hey, ain't nothing wrong with a brother taking care of himself, keeping himself clean, looking neat and stuff like that, but it was an ushering in of something else, and then it moved slowly, then it became okay, and next thing you know, you got guys wearing skirts, and they do this through the means of feminizing those who black males tend to look up to, entertainers and athletes, look at what they wear now. That's not an accident. And then what we'll normally counter with is, well, we're not the only ones doing it. Well, first of all, we're a marginalized group. What white people do can never be our standard of how we behave, first of all. Second of all, because they have significantly larger numbers than we do, they can afford to have a subsector doing a certain thing because they still have the numbers and the strength to influence what's going on. And because white males are in power, they can operate from a place of power regardless of how they're viewed in their image because they control the money. We have at our, at, 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 at our disposal on the very primitive level our masculinity. And there's an assault on black masculinity and they use the term toxic in front of masculinity to wage that war. And what you end up with is anything associated with black masculinity is ultimately termed uh, toxic 
and associated with negative behavior. Negative behavior is never masculine. Masculine by its very nature starts with protection. So anything that causes harm cannot be by the very definition masculine. Just because a man is doing it doesn't make it masculine. So then what we must understand, what is masculinity is the execution of your truest nature to protect, to provide, to lift up and promote, to edify, to be a divine connection, a priest in your home, a divine connection to the most high. And to be a prophet. What do you mean by a prophet? Be the force in your home that speaks into the life of those you cover. They should know who they are. They should know what they can expect out of their lives. They should be reaching for higher heights knowing that they're capable because the prophet in the house is speaking into their lives. See, that's masculinity. But if you allow the external world to define masculinity, masculinity now is anything docile that doesn't stand up against anything, that doesn't make noise, but does what is expected and sits and be and, and, and is quiet and still until asked to speak. And see, that's not masculinity. Masculinity stands for what's right. Masculinity defends with a ferocity that means I'll die to protect what I cover. And that is what frightens them. It's true masculinity. So there's an assault on masculinity. And anytime somebody, anytime somebody, especially a black man, does something uh, egregious and and, 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 and heartless and, 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 and evil, it's called toxic masculinity. No, it's toxic behavior. Masculinity cannot be toxic by its very nature and definition. Any type of toxic behavior is not a part of a person's masculinity. It is a removal from that masculinity. It is a failure to act in that masculinity, but it's not masculine. The same thing with the femininity of a woman. The purest part of a woman is a femininity. It is not in any way toxic. Women's behavior become toxic when they move away from their femininity. And all of these things are being encouraged. The very nature of the gender war is outside of the masculine and feminine realm. And it's being pushed on us in astronomical, at an astronomical rate, and we are not prepared to withstand it. And it's showing. I want us, as a people, to develop a natural yearning to know, because when you know, you're no longer at the uh, behest of those who mean you no good. You understand when something isn't what it's supposed to be and you know why and you know what to do. It's in developing the mindset and understanding what to do that we develop the capacity to rise as a people, to become unified in our movements, not monolithic in our existence, but unified in our moving, understand that we are in some way connected. You don't have to be the same, but you have to understand that you're connected. You have to have a respect for the overall existence of the people. It's this individualized mindset that they've been inculcating into our, our ideologies that separate us and make it easy for us to be plucked a few at a time until we become insignificant because the ones who were supposed to be the leaders, the one who was supposed to be the minds, the one who was supposed to be the warriors, the one who was supposed to be the coverings, the one who was supposed to be the nurturers have been plucked. And all is left now is confusion. And we are falling for it. They're educating our children into stupidity and docility preparing them to be nothing but slaves to a system that never furthers their yearning and their quest for power. The system is never going to empower those it benefits from being unempowered. 
It is the responsibility of the unempowered to radically move in a way that empowers themselves. And this is where we are failing horribly. Like I said, I'm going to launch research into this uh, gender uh, fluent uh, connectivity to mass shootings that's starting to peak now. Again, the sample size is small, the unit of analysis isn't significant, but it's enough for me to take notice that within a short month, we've got, within a short few months, we have three. So is this the beginning of a trend? And trends are driven by something. They aren't by happenstance. They aren't uh, arbitrary. They're driven by something and we need to know what it is. Is it a conspiracy? Is it a new uh, elemental component of psychosis? Or is something more nefarious behind it? These are the things we need to discover. We need to understand where we're going in society and why so that we can be influencers and not just alone for the ride again um, I'm going to get out of here now if you believe in the work we do as I said in the beginning show some love uh, for those of you who want to show specific love for the young lady <clears throat> but you don't want to give to the organization I'm good send me an email and I will give you the information you need uh, I told her I'm not big on outing people I don't want to go make no big thing put somebody out there and embarrass them I don't think that should be necessary but I get it you don't want to work through I'm, I'm good with that but I do want this young lady to feel safe and I want her to have a place and I want her to be able to do what she needs to do to get herself together as she uh, sit, sit, uh, she situates herself in a new city so Again, show some love, show some support in one way or another. But we need to make that happen. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, finish my day, but I had to drop that on you. So once again, take care. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping here. Hope that everybody is doing okay. Uh, look, I'm not going to be long. I'm here to talk to you. Uh, straightforward. Look, the easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do is to take action, to do something to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also, as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do. We consistently do and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via cash app, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, cash app account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement we are trying to make a difference but we do need support this is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway 
and it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst. It's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be